All right, we're recording. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ann Johnson from Professional Engineering Services, and I am the program or project manager for our firm in completing all of the virtual business training and technical assistance through MnDOT. Uh, we are recording this class. Uh, we will be posting it later on MnDOT's website, as well as the materials that were emailed to you earlier. Uh, if you do not have those materials emailed to you, uh, if you somehow we had a glitch there, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll make sure to send them to you immediately. Um, I will not be teaching the class today. My friend and colleague, Ross Gentink, who's the CFO at Professional Engineering Services, is going to take over shortly, but I thought that I could facilitate the introductions and the welcome. Eric Johnson, also from PE Services, is going to be uh, monitoring the chat. He'll be interrupting Ross periodically uh, with questions or with needs for clarification. So if you have any concerns, put them in the chat, or as I said earlier, simply unmute yourself and interrupt. We are all experienced teachers that won't throw us, and we want to make sure that everybody understands uh, all of the material that is presented. Now, today's class is only an hour and a half long. Uh, negotiating a contract is very important. Uh, I have negotiated some bad contracts <laughs> or some contracts that weren't in my best interest. Uh, if you don't know, I'm a DBE business owner or former business owner. Uh, I used to own PE services and I started it in 1995. I just recently sold it, but still work for the company. And so uh, many of the classes that we are offering were born out of my experience, uh, as well as, of course, collaboration with MnDOT for what classes they wanted to present. But negotiating a contract is 100% important, very, very good for you to be here. Um, I think with that, I'm going to let Tracy introduce herself. And Matt, if you want to, anybody from MnDOT, go right ahead. Tracy? Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Jackson. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Office of Civil Rights here at MnDOT, and we're excited to offer and provide these uh, courses to you virtually and some in person, I understand. So um, this is just one of many. Um, we have a lot of training happening here in March and April. In addition, we have events coming up. So uh, just a couple announcements. Um, what I'll be putting in the chat is additional classes to sign up for um, and then through our supportive services as well as two events. One of the largest procurement fairs is SADBOC, um, the Small and Disadvantaged Opportunity Council. So that happens, um, we're back in person this year. It's gonna be probably over a thousand people over at the Brooklyn C Center Heritage Center. It's an opportunity to promote your business. So I will be putting a link in there to sign up for that on April 20th. Um, if you are a construction firm, I happen to be on the line here, Hennepin County is having a construction fair. I will also put that link in as well. But our team, in addition to Ann and her team here, are here to support you um, and to mentor and coach you. So please reach out, ask questions today. Contracts are important. Um, I am going to pass it over to Matt, who is my colleague in our, on our team. Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, I work with Tracy. And uh, I'm excited to be here. I uh, work with in business and program development, Office of Civil Rights. So yeah, if you need any help with anything, uh, please reach out. Great, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, this is Ann again. Just want everybody to know also as part of this contract, we have been um, asked by MnDOT to meet with any of you that request a follow-up, uh, either virtually or in person to talk about any of the classes that we've offered. We've talked about creating a business uh, portfolio, uh, creating a business capability statement, using social media for marketing. Um, uh, Eric, help me out here. Um, <laughs> last week, we talked about insurance. Uh, oh, creating a website. And actually, I think I got them all. So I don't need your help, Eric. Uh, of course, today, we're going to talk about negotiating a contract. And if any of these items are interesting to you or something that you struggle with, please reach out, put it in the chat or you will be getting an evaluation. And the last question is, would you like a follow-up meeting? So with that, it's 8.10. I'm gonna throw it over to um, uh, 
Ross and let him introduce himself. And then I think we're going to do a quick round robin of everybody just telling us who you are and what your company does or, you know, what your area is. So Ross, you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Yeah, that sounds good. And thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Ross Gentink. Um, I work uh, here at PE Services. I'm the CFO. I spent uh, 20 years in the civil engineering industry. About half of that has been uh, in, in the design world, whether it's in traffic design or highway design, um, different aspects of that. And the other half of it's been in construction. Uh, the construction half, I spend uh, a lot of time as a contract manager for for construction projects representing rep representing the owner. And so I'll see a lot of contracts that come through that are between contractors, subcontractors. I'll negotiate contract errors, which are usually specification type things or plan errors or uh, unforeseen conditions. Um, probably with that experience, I've, I've helped uh, negotiate design build contracts with owners um helped write design build contracts um, probably there's been a dozen design build jobs i've worked on drafting the contracts for the owners some cmgc projects so quite a bit of complex um contract stuff and then uh same time as we as consultants enter into agreements with with owners or with subcontract or with a with a prime contractor could be a design firm could be a construction company i've helped uh, navigate through uh, pieces of that. Uh, some of it I've been the lead on. Others I've, uh, uh, as they get really complicated, I've turned it over to the attorney, and I may be the one negotiating. But I'm getting comments from somebody who's uh, in a lot more professional level of uh, contract management than than probably most of us are on this call. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's my background. Been at PE Services a little less than a year now, and uh, it's a great opportunity. A lot of fun working. Uh, for a smaller company, working with a lot of DBEs is is mm -hmm. a is a great benefit. It's a lot more rewarding work, I think, than the large consulting uh, company work that I've done in the past. So great. thanks, Anne. Yeah, well, Ross, I know you're an expert here, so thank you for stepping up and preparing the class. Eric Johnson is also from PE Services. Eric, you want to say good morning? Yep. Hey, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm just going to be kind of watching the chat here and uh, assisting any way I can, I guess. This is a, I'm more of a uh, English teacher <laughs> than I am a contracts guy. But uh, so I had, I participated early in the, in the classes on some of the, um, the content development for um, uh, that, that uh, for websites and for social media, um, things of that nature, but uh, I'll be here to assist in any way I can. If you have questions, put them up in the chat, and I'll uh, make sure that Ross becomes aware of that and can address them. Uh, but it's good to be here, and glad to see people participating. And if we can help, uh, that's why we're here. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, there are quite a few new people on, so I'm just going to put a plug in. Eric was a teacher, uh, high school English teacher for many years, and he continues to write, as do I, for our profession. So Eric specifically has been really helpful with people developing uh, business capability statements and portfolios, website content, et cetera. So if you're interested and need help with the written word and with writing stuff, uh, Eric and I are happy to meet with you. All right, now I'm just gonna go around the particip participant list and I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and tell us what your business is and what you do. So Ahmed, I see that you're unmuted. Can you go ahead and just tell us who you are and what you do? Yep, uh, Ahmed Ali with Safa Construction Services. Uh, it's a small business, uh, about a year old. And I do uh, demolition, uh, erosion control, and uh, site cleaning. Excellent, welcome Ahmed. Uh, Cassie. Yeah, I, uh, I'm Cassie. I own a few companies. One of them is a outdoor maintenance, so a lawn care landscaping irrigation company. Uh, my other company is a full tree removal or trimming service. And then my newest one is a um, bulk road de-icing company. So basically we buy untreated salt, bring it into our uh, facility, treat it, and then send it out to vendors, municipals, churches, uh, hospitals, anyone who needs it. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Well, Cassie, I look forward to meeting you. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Erica, Dr. Erica. 
Good morning. This is uh, Erica Salina. I'm the CEO and uh, pr principal consultant at Working Smarts in based in Minneapolis. And uh, we do organization development uh, consulting. So uh, lots and lots of leadership and management development, um, culture change, uh, change leadership, that sort of work. Um, obviously at DBE and Great. in business for 12 years. 12? Yes. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, let's see, somebody is listed as being on their iPhone. I'm not sure who that is, but can the iPhone person introduce yourself? I think that's probably me. Uh, my name is Vicki Rodosovich. I'm actually remote right now in between things. Um, I'm a controller for a construction company, LS Black Constructors in St. Paul. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> Excellent. Do you guys just do general? Do you do heavy highway, earthwork? What kind we, of construction do you do? We're a general contractor. All right. And heavy and federal work. Great. Well, welcome, Vicki. I'm glad to have you. Um, Thank you. Let's see. Uh, Jeff Eggert works for PE Services. Jeff, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, Ann. Um, thanks. I'm Jeff Eggert with PE Services. Like Ann mentioned, I'm the director of construction services here and joining in to listen to Ann and Ross do a great presentation here. All right, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Lori Ryan has joined in from MnDOT. Lori, you want to say good morning? Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Lori Ryan, and I work in the Engineering Services Division at MnDOT. And there, and my role there is as um, li liaison to MnDOT PT consultants and partners. So I'm available to consult with any. PT consultants who need assistance on anything regarding engineering services or anything throughout MnDOT. So I'm excited to be here today as a guest and hear about the companies on the line. Good, excellent, welcome. You know, Thank Stephanie, you. I can see that you do not have a mic, but I can't see you on the list. So put in the chat who you work with or work for and I will happily um, introduce you. Let's see who else is here. Uh, Wola, Wola Sabande, good morning. Wola, can you unmute yourself and say good morning? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good morning. Uh, I am not in construction business. But I, I own a company. I uh, the ability to draw and alcohol people. That's what I do. All right. Welcome. You've got a little bit of an echo, so I'm going to mute you. Mute, mute you again. And has any is anybody else on who wants to say good morning or introduce themselves? All right, let's get started then. It's eight. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, no, no. Who's the iPhone? Go ahead. Uh, I'm Sue Burnham. I'm calling on behalf of Chanel Thomas for Chanel oh, okay. Construction. It's a, a new business. And it's uh, mostly after cleanup. All right. After construction cleanup. Okay, excellent. And did you say your name is, uh, now from the chat, I see that your name you said was Keisha, but that didn't sound like that. Who? Can you say your name one more time? My name is Sue. Sue. I put it in the chat. Sue for Samantha. Oh, you're the Sue. Stuff. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Welcome. All right, I see you. All right. Welcome, everybody. All right. With that, I am going to uh, physically mute everybody except for Ross. And Ross, we're going to let you get started. All right. Great introductions. A great variety of uh, different business owners and uh, and and people working for small businesses. Uh, this uh, negotiating contract is not not the most exciting topic. I'll try to try to keep it as interesting as as possible with a few stories maybe and a few reasons why some of these things are important. Um, we'll, uh, we'll work our way through negotiating a contract and then we'll, we'll talk through, um, oops, a little jumpy there, risks. So we'll talk through the standard contract components. We'll go into risk and review of a contract. Um, then we'll talk about overhead rate and we'll go into computing a pre-award audit, which is a, a is, pretty detailed, but so we'll hit on that 
kind of at a high level, what are the, the items that you have to turn in? Uh, MnDOT does already have a great video on pre-award audit that, that I'll send a link out to. Um, but we'll hit on that lightly. And, and then obviously we're a resource here. We do dozens of those every year and, uh, and can help through it. But uh, so that's kind of our, our learning objectives. Hopefully by the end of the day, you guys are, are aware of, uh, of some key components here, pick up a few tips on maybe how to, how to navigate these a, a little more successfully. And uh, like Ann said, um, maybe hear a little of some of our failures and hopefully you uh, don't make the same mistake that, that we make um or have made in the past so in negotiating a contract so um the purpose of a contract is um is really to avoid or the purpose of reviewing a contract and negotiating a contract in your favor is really to avoid unfair risk allocation um, it's important to manage the risk understand the risk i guess you can't manage it if you don't understand it so it's important to understand the risk and then manage the risk. And it allows you to, to produce a fair and competitive price. If somebody puts, um, puts more, more on your plate than, than you would typically see as far as managing a piece of a project, whether it's, it's putting you more responsible for design or delivery or schedule or other components of a project, um, that may be needed to be reflected in your price. You're taking on more risk, you have more liability, you may have to, um, you, you may have to pay more for, uh, you have to get more money to make sure you cover that risk to make it worth your time. Uh, so we'll start out here. So the purpose of a contract is to formalize a relationship. So a contract is a formal way to say, you and I are gonna do something together, we're going to agree on how we're going to do it, what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, uh, and how we're going to get paid. You know, like I said, the risk allocation piece, and it really sets the rules of that relationship. And then the last piece, which is really important in a contract, is is dispute resolution. How are we when things don't quite go well? How can we work together to successfully come to a um, you know an amicable solution? It might not be. Might not be perfect for everybody, but the d dispute resolution process is really important in a, in a contract, maybe in the, the professional, the PT contracts, um, professional technical service contracts, it's, it's still very important to get in there. It's less, it's less used in the construction world. It can be a, um, a, a piece that's more frequently bumped into. Um, so purpose of a contract. So I'll talk about a project that we had, or, um, not at P services, but in a previous company I worked for, that we were working on a project and we were we were helping, it was a design build project and we were working for the contractor and we were helping the contractor with the design. The way our contract was written, um, we would provide a design for them, they would bid the project and we would move forward from there with um, with with successfully building the project if, if we want it. And on this project, we, we, did the, we did the roadway design, we did the bridge design, and um, kind of come down to the last second on the, on the bidding process. Uh, There's a few major changes which helped out the schedule in a large way. And, and we, uh, we worked with the contractor, the contractor agreed to what that scope change was gonna be for bidding the job and they went and bid the job. We get to construction and we find out there's a, a pretty significant about a 30,000 cubic yard earthwork, earthwork bus. Um, you know, that 30,000 cubic yards, you're probably looking at 10, 10 to 15, or actually I think on this job, it was $18 a cubic yard. There was no easy haul, it was all trucking. And so we had to haul in um, 30,000 yards of dirt to make the road profile work. Get to the contract piece. so like the contractor looks at us and says well you're the designer you screwed up you owe us five hundred thousand dollars well our entire design contract was probably a roughly around a million dollars so to pay out a five hundred thousand dollar claim on a project is puts a lot of liability on us so we went to the contract and, and said okay well what did we actually say we would give you and and we we never we said we'd give them a design but it was very clear in our contract that they were to provide the quantity takeoffs and the cost estimating for our design. 
And so we gave them a design. They they bid the project, and they said, well, you guys did give us quantities, which we actually did, which was not required by our contract. And we wrote in the contract that that we wouldn't that any information that we did give them was for information only that was above and beyond the design plans. Well, at the end of the day, um, contracts are about relationships and working is really about relationships. So we we could have went to mediation or the next step of, of arbitration or eventually a lawsuit or um, but it, if you make it that far in a contract, you probably are, especially in a professional services contract, you're probably never going to work with the person again. So the first thing with a with a contract, especially a dispute, is to try to work it out between your guys' selves. And we realized there was some some uh, some of it was on our our part. We did have a grading error. It actually was due to a, a design change that the contractor requested, and then they never followed up with uh, quality quantity takeoffs. So it was about a five hundred thousand uh, dollar bust in quantity. Um, the contractor knew that they had the risk of quantities on the job. And so they actually told me after we got done negotiating, we did settle on a number. It was about $70,000 is what they, that we ended up paying on it. And then we actually split that between some other cost savings that we had helped them with on the job. But they, they acknowledged to me at the end that they had about a million dollars in contingency on the project for, for things like this. So, so they understood the contract probably better than we did when we went into that contract. And they knew their risk and they held contingency for that risk. It doesn't mean they didn't try to poke us to get that money back, but the contract didn't actually put us in a position to have to pay that. But we did settle just on some money, just for the fact that we did realize probably is something that we should have, uh, we should have been helping them with. So that's kind of, you know, the purpose of a contract is it, is it comes down to things don't always go well. Um, and when they don't go well, we need to have rules on on why how we're working together, what we're doing together, and what's expected from each party. So, valid contracts. Um, there are a lot of invalid contracts out there. Nobody might ever know it, and you might settle on something on a contract that wasn't valid. But, um, oh, kind of the components of a contract you must have an offer and acceptance, right? It's not okay to send a contract and neither party ever signs it. Um, it's not a valid contract. So pretty obvious that um, we both have to sign it. We both have to accept the offer. There has to be a consideration. So something of value has to be exchanged. In, in our world, we're usually either trading a design or staffing for money, right? Like that's what most of us were getting paid. So you, you might be doing a construction piece and you're getting money. So that's your consideration. Uh, capacity, both people have to be of sound mind. It, uh, uh, and maybe you see this more on TV shows or something than anything, but uh, somebody tricks somebody into signing a contract or, or they were in not the right mind or they didn't have all the authority. Um, and then the legality, you can't, you can't write things, you can't just write anything in a contract that people want. It has to be legal. It has to be allowed by law. You know, it has to abide by state and federal law. There's no exceptions there. If you write things in a contract that are not legal, it, it might invalidate the contract. It, it definitely makes it a lot harder to navigate the contract uh, when a dispute arises. Um, but the legality is very important. So you know, who does contract review, you know, in, in a small company, um, you know, a company officer could be the owner, could be a, a CEO, CFO, uh, could be a director, could be, you know, all it could be a, a lot of different people, but, but make sure it's somebody with experience. Um, you know, at a big company, you might have legal counsel on staff or an agency, you might have legal com company uh, on staff. Or if you if you're small or it's an unfamiliar contract, you a transactional or a contracts attorney would be who you would uh, who you would go to. And we do this. I won't say we do this a lot, but we definitely do it on things unique here. Um, that as, as I've seen contracts that that are really really long. Like we have contracts that are four pages long, and they're 
They're nice. They're easy. You can just check the boxes and go, yep, this one makes sense. Sometimes you'll get into a, a, a contract with somebody that it's 10 or 15 or 20 pages long and, and you just start looking at it going, ah, this is, this is probably over some of our heads. So, so it does pay to have um, a relationship with a, with an attorney that can help you out in a, in a short time frame because usually we don't have a lot of time um, to review contracts. At the same time, don't sign anything you don't understand. So, so it, it doesn't make sense to rush a contract if you can't get good legal advice to understand all the components of it. So just a big piece to think about that, that you should have, and they're not usually, I mean, they're all attorneys are expensive, but if you get a contracts attorney, they're usually pretty efficient. Like I've seen, you know, they can, they can run through a 20 page contract in maybe an hour or something and they'll bill you $250 or something. So, and if it's a, if it's a $50,000 or $100,000 or, you know, your risk on that contract of not understanding it. Um, if it's a small contract, $3,000, $5,000 or something, maybe it doesn't make sense to pull an attorney and you're just willing to accept that risk. Um, but, but just keep, keep that in mind. And, um, just maybe some pointers on, on contracts, you know, I kind of hit on it there, but keep it simple. Um, if you're writing contracts for a subcontractor, you know, we, we, we here, we have a template that's pretty simple and, um, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It'll hit on these basic components. Um, don't duplicate information in a contract. If you already have a scope that, that came out with the RFP or with the proposal that you, you or the prime contractor submitted, if there's already a scope and you're doing one little piece of that scope, just grab that scope and insert it into your contract as an attachment. Don't try to rewrite it or change the language in it or things get muddy when, when the contract doesn't match what the owners may be asking for or, or what the prime is asking you to do something different than, than what the contract documents that are linked to the project are saying. Um, same thing with budget, key roles. If there's a list of quantities, you know, and you're getting that out of a plan set, if you're writing a contract to do construction work, um, you know, just it's better to insert it in the appendix instead of fat fingering it in a contract because errors in contracts, which do happen, just complicate things. If it says in the appendix that you were going to do this, it says in the in the main body that you're going to do it for a different price. I'm sure the the prime, if it doesn't go well, is gonna is gonna push you for whatever option better suits them. Like I said, it just complicates things. Um, authorized signer, this is a good one to always think about, is who actually has the authority to sign. I mean, you might be making an invalid contract because you're working with somebody who's who's maybe an acquaintance, a good friend even, and and they work for a business and you sign a contract with them and you start doing work for them. And then let's say they leave the company and then something goes wrong on that and they go back to the contract and you say, hey, you owe me this money and they look at and go, boy, that person wasn't even authorized in our company to to sign a contract. And so just think about those things that that make sure you're negotiating with the person that can actually sign the contract or that it's going to be reviewed and signed by by somebody who has a, um, is an authorized signer. Um, you know, audit contract language, you know, so read everything, you know. Note anything that's confusing or misleading in words, um, things that you don't understand that there's always, I won't say always, but I, when I review a contract, we did one yesterday. I'll actually show you that one in a little while, but we did one yesterday that um, pretty straightforward. We went through it. I highlighted a couple of things. I went back and looked at previous contract and there, it's pretty similar language. So it's like, okay, this is something we've accepted for the, with this client before. So we'll be fine and moving forward with it. Um, don't be afraid to ask for revisions or just even ask questions. Um, don't, don't be afraid to just ask the, the person you're working with, the prime or wh whoever's writing that contract for you, go, hey, I don't understand why you have this language in here. I've signed 10 of these and I've never seen it before, or maybe I've never signed one, but I'm just learning and, and just make sure that you're clear. And they might tell you, they might say, oh, don't worry about it. We've never seen it before or we've never had to use it before. That might be a flag to say, well, maybe I should talk to an attorney, um, get real legal advice, um, you know, but 
And, and then don't be afraid to ask for revisions. If you see things that you just don't like, they might sign it, they, they might revise it, they might not revise it. Um, at least you noted that, that it's something that, that it's maybe not, uh, not normal for what you'd normally do. Um, you know, so then you want to try to get rid of unfair overreaching provisions. So that's a big piece that, that to think about is, um, you know, so anything that increases your liability or jeopardizes your insurance, neither you or your client want to be in a contract that jeopardizes your insurance. We all have insurance. We all have insurance limits. Jeff and Ann talked about that a couple of weeks past. And that insurance is there to, to protect all of us so we can do work. We can, you know, we all hope to do good work. We hope never to need insurance. Um, but at the end of the day, if I if we sign a contract that my insurance company won't support, you don't want to do business with me anyway, because if something goes wrong, I don't have enough money to cover a million or $10 million claim on a, on a big construction project. Or if a huge accident happens that I might only have a small part of a project, uh, maybe a $50,000 piece if you're clearing a site or something, but you might cause an accident that, or one of your workers might that, um, and if that contract violates your insurance, obviously not a good deal. So, so Ross, you should also know your insurance policies. Ross, Tracy has her hand up. Sure, Tracy. Hi, um, again, this is Tracy with MnDOT. Say, I just had a, uh, wanted to pause there a minute. You um, just, I think a slide back you were talking about, don't be afraid to, um, negotiate right to make yep. changes or ask for something i think that's really a a barrier or a challenge or a concern for our small businesses are so excited they got their first contract or they're they're getting a contract and they don't want to make waves right so yep. they're like well we'll just sign it and just go on um and i i hear you encouraging and i want to encourage too whether it's a contract with a contractor or consultant, or if it's a contract with an agency. Um, what we have found is that this is normal, right? This it's, It is okay to say, hey, at this languages or this clause, I'm um, concerned about it. This is an, I, can we remove that and add different language? I think it's important. Um, it's showing that you are actually reading your contract and that you're um, ready to go on that. Um, and then one other comment is, um, in regards to, you know, we are very small businesses on here. Um, you know, most of them won't have legal staff at, um, or someone, an expert in their business who does contract language. So um, this is an opportunity for you small businesses to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one with Ross after this, um, even though we're going to go through this today, just to kind of specific to your industry. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. This is good information. So yeah, Ross, yeah, can I just say one thing? Sorry to jump in, but I just want to piggyback a little bit on what Tracy said. So one thing I see in the field as an inspector, when we're working with uh, contractors, large and small, the I mean, I can't emphasize enough to read what you sign. It's just so important to be familiar with the documents because a lot of times the larger agencies are going to do kind of a cut and paste sort of thing. And so they're just going to be information that's, oh, this is just our regular contract. It's going to cover this, that, and the other thing. And you're so focused on the specific job that you're doing that there may be things in the contract that kind of sneak up on you. So just be prepared to read everything. And if you don't understand something, that's when you have to ask questions before any of the work begins. So I just want to say that I've seen that a number of times where, you know, we're, we're rolling through a project and all of a sudden I go, well, there's all these testing requirements that you sign contract you're going to do. Oh no, we don't know how to do that. Or we can't do that. Well, that wasn't the time to ask. You have to get ahead of that as well as you can. So again, if you're brand new into this, don't accept a standard contract as standard because it can it it can include things that that you may not be prepared for. That's all. I, I just an observation that I have from the yeah. Field. I wanna I wanna offer up uh, just a little bit of of burning that we experienced at PE Services. We were sent a contract once that was unreadable, and um, it was by a good client, somebody who we've done lots of work with before, but I couldn't read it. And I, I'm sure he was operating in good faith, but I asked, um, well, I can't read this contract. He's like, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. Well, it ended up costing us tens of thousands of dollars because 
I didn't read, I couldn't read the hourly rates and they were not correct, but that's the contract I had signed. It ended up being a MnDOT contract and MnDOT is very um, adamant about adhering to the contract uh, requirements. So even though my contract was with another consulting firm, the consulting firm's contract was with MnDOT and we were stuck. So, um, you know, raise a stink, be assertive, go look at the contract in person, because this actually happened to us pretty recently after 20 years of experience. It just was a bad move on my part, and I should have been more assertive. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, definitely. Definitely all great points. Um, so then, then to push it the opposite direction, be assertive, ask questions, and um, and I've done this before on lots of uh, many contracts. And uh, one of them that one response that I've gotten that maybe slows down the process, they might just be pass through requirements. And so uh, I was working with a DOT that I hadn't worked for in the past, and we got a contract, and and I saw some things that I didn't, I'd never seen before, and. Uh, and when I pushed back on it, it was interesting. They actually told me that, and that this was working for a, a contractor doing DOT work. Um, uh, and they pushed through on me that this is just the pass through requirements. And half of it actually was, and the other half, he was just saying that to try to move me along and, and get the process signed. So um, I got a checklist we'll go through a little bit later that. And sometimes you got to look at the relationship you're building and the and the risk that's uh, maybe how uh, how well can you trust the person you're working with. Uh, but something to think through too is that sometimes uh, it's just purely the exact wording from the prime contract that they're or from the owner's contract that the prime is pushing through on you. And that's true, like with railroad work, the railroad insurance requirements are just a super basic one to go. Those are just passed through that the, the railroad requires it. They have an agreement with the owner who has an agreement with the prime that we get on board. Now we got to meet those same requirements. Some of it are, are, are a little bit, um, that one's obvious, but some are, are less obvious that it's something that, that would be out of the ordinary. Um, and like I said, you don't want to jeopardize your insurance. So make sure that, uh, that the scope of work is work that you're insured to do and make sure that the word wording is similar to what your insurance policy will cover. Um, otherwise, you could be in trouble there. Um, so as you're reviewing a contract, um, words have meaning, you know, and so th there's there's a lot of other words to think through too, but these are words that, that I'll highlight the red ones more than others. Um, but the ones I like to, to highlight on here, you know, sufficient, that's very subjective. Optimize, what does optimize mean? Maximize or minimize? Like you don't want to minimize errors because what is acceptable? Well, one error is not acceptable. Well, maybe somebody thought 10 errors was, or maximize or optimize your design. What's an optimized design? If do we build custom pipe to get a, a 21 and a half inch pipe when a 24 inch would work? Um, the owner might go, I wanted custom pipe, you know, and you go, well. So get rid of these words and replace them with statements that that make more sense. Um, and you don't have to get rid of them like the one shall is one that's in here. So a lot of times they'll tell you, you shall do this. Well, you shall carry insurance. That one, fine, shall is fine to be in there, right? I have to carry insurance, that's fine. Um, but I shall manage the schedule when I'm not the prime. That one maybe doesn't make sense. Or I shall meet the schedule regardless of contract issues or you know there are things like that that they'll push on you that you go you know the schedule is a mutually agreed upon piece that if it's not written directly in the contract to be negotiated uh, you, you shall never you know you you don't need to take that liability or managing staff is one supervised um, so you just look for you know this is a good starting list of words that as you go through a contract that I'll highlight them and just make sure I hit on that sentence and go, okay, what are they telling me that I'll do I'll, all, like you will ensure all design meets certain level of quality. And you're like, well, I'm only doing the drainage design. I'm not gonna make sure all design meets it. I'll, I'll cross that word out and write that 
either all design performed by the sub consultant, which would be us, or all design or all drainage design, um, you know, but, but look at those words and think through, yeah. you know, any, you know, you will fix any error or you will, um, you know, the, these words, you just see that they're strong words that drive you into it. The other one too, that it's always fun to talk about is assure, insure, and insure, or insure and insure. So you have assure, right? Assure means to promise, which is great. And these words will be used interchangeably. They're used wrong. There's all kinds of words in contracts that are used wrong. So then you have insure means to make sure, make certain. Well, we can't really do anything to make certain. We can meet we can meet the industry standard of care. We can. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do, but we don't ever make anything certain. You know, the word certain or certify. You know, some of these, but um, to insure mean and then insure means to protect against risk. Well, we can't protect against risk either. I mean, we can reduce risk. We can have a quality pro process that minimizes risk. We can, you know, there's things we can do to to help risk, but we can't ensure we can't we can't protect against risk, which would mean all risk. We're never certain, and we really don't want to promise anything. We want to just we want everything to be spelled out. Um, so contracts, um, indemnification, this is, so we'll go through some terms and clauses in indemnification is always one that, that it's interesting. Um, I'll talk maybe not bad about big companies, but it was my experience with big, working for big companies that the things that they put in their contract are the things they take out of other people's contracts. So they will just write in there that they'll be indemnified against against all errors and or missions on the project. It's like, well, no, we only want to be indemnified against, we only want to indemnify them against the work that we actually do. Uh, you know, so this is a better indemnification statement here where you know, it holds harmless against all liability, loss, damage, cost, expenses, and clients may incur, but not limited to attorney's fees, which a client may be required to pay directly by reasonable error or omission by contractor. Now we're the contractor. So if you looked at the beginning of a contract, it would have defined us as a contractor. So if it doesn't have by contractor, which a lot of them don't, um, they might be putting you on the hook for all indemnification. So they would never pay for any errors on the project. You're on the hook for all of them. So that's legally, you took the responsibility for work that you're not doing. Uh, so I guess just to hit on a few things, terms and conditions, the basic rules of the contract are your terms and conditions. The purpose of a indemnification clause is to protect a party from third party claims. So, so if, if I, and you know, MnDOT has indemnification in their contracts, which makes sense. We do, the primes do, it's just a matter of how is that worded. I only want to indemnify. So MnDOT doesn't have to pay for my errors is what this is saying. And my, you know, my professional liability insurance won't cover if, if I, they won't cover somebody else's work. So if, if they do write something in here that says I'll cover all design and we're only doing maybe the traffic piece, then my insurance won't cover it anyway. Cause it's, so it's just a bad statement, but you'll see them do it on, on uh, big companies, do it, little companies do it. And it's, it always annoyed me that we would write in our contracts, which we don't hear it services but we would write in our contracts the things we didn't want or we didn't want to sign if somebody else would give it to us um, so the indemnification clause um so like i said it requires one party to reverse the other of recoverable damages from a third party the indemnifying party is is uh, demanding is demanding payment the indemnified party is required to pay um and like I said, there's one-sided indemnification clauses that put you on the hook for everybody else's problems. And so just be aware of that. Um, this one kind of gets back to in, that insure word or, um, you know, what is a standard of care that we're going to do work? We don't ensure that everything's right. We ensure that, you know, this one says furnish its best skill, the skill and judgment in the performance of a consultant's work. Um, 
So standard of care is saying how, what kind of quality are we going to provide? And you'll see this more in, um, I guess you'll see it in construction contracts too, but it's in professional technical service contracts, you'll see it a lot more, but you might not like this statement. I wouldn't like this statement because I don't like the word best skilled, that's subjective. Um, skill and judgment are bad words, but we might replace it with something like consultant agrees to perform its services in a manner consistent with the level of care and skill ordinarily used by other professionals performing similar services at the same time under similar circumstances. So the same time is kind of important because what are the laws today? You know, that's what we're being held to, similar circumstances. If I'm if I'm designing a, a box culvert over a stream, it's completely different than a than a bridge over a huge river. So similar circumstances, um, standard of care ordinarily used by other professionals. So it's saying we're doing what any normal person would do. Um, and it's a risk if 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 it becomes subjective and then it just provides uh, um, provides spots for that you could argue in the future and it becomes a dispute. Uh, maybe just touch on a little bit. So the standard of care really falls back to common law, which are which is laws that the court has already settled, or not laws, they're they're rulings the court has made that are now considered law because of the way the court has ruled. So um, so they're kind of unwritten laws based on legal precedents. And so that's that's the standard of care we want to we want to kind of go by is what would the law what what has been ruled before as normal engineering practice? We don't want to take on more liability than that. Um, permission for information only. This is one that that I was talking about that earthwork error that we had in the past. Um, the statement that we had in that contract. I, I don't have that contract with me anymore, but it was not written well at all. Um, but for, for, for information only, you might want to add if you're if you're doing design for somebody, but they're they're doing the quantities, or you're doing a part of a design and aren't actually responsible. Like you might be doing the um, you might be doing the the hydraulic design for a roadway project but you're not actually drafting it and you're not doing the quantity takeoff. So you'd say, well, these runs need to be 24 inch pipe. This needs this catch basin here. This needs this, um, you know, the, these structures here. And, but we might not be doing the quantity takeoffs. So then it might be somebody else's job. So this is a statement. You might want to modify it for different things, but, um, um, but don't take on responsibility that's normally owned by somebody else. So if you're a subcontractor, um, don't take on, you know, whether it's a design or in the construction field. Um, but this one kind of is a is a good one for design that, uh, depending on what your role is, you might be responsible for quantities, and so so maybe you 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 modify this a little bit, or maybe you don't you don't have it in the contract. Um, uh, other pieces of the contract, um, key dates are obvious. Every contract should have dates in it. It should have a termination date because contracts, I mean, by definition, a contract has a beginning and an end. There are uh, other ways of doing ongoing contracts. You can have a, a master service agreement, which is a contract, but uh, which also probably should have an expiration date on it. Uh, but key dates are important. So make sure you understand the dates. And to go with that, understanding the schedule is uh, is a good piece to know that that and then understand how the schedule works. Are you beholden to whatever they tell you to? If they say, "Hey, you need to do this when I tell you to," I mean, sometimes it works that way. If they're if they're building a, a foundation of a building and you're coming in to to start building slabs, you clearly can't build the slabs till they're done with their work. Now you can tell them. Uh, you can write in the contract that that we'll have a flexible schedule, but you know we need to have 30 days notice of any key changes or something like that. But um, but make sure you understand dates and schedule. Termination, um, like I said, all of them have to have an end. Um, they might have an option to extend with notice, or they can you know have a revised contract like we do that with MinDOT, um, where you contract goes longer, so you just you just take and amend the contract and and make the date longer. Uh, 
the other termination clause is just termination for no reason that most contracts say that if I lose a key person and I can't deliver on that contract, I, I have to give notice that I can't deliver. And it's usually not that long. The time frame might be seven days or 14 days. You don't want to do that. It really messes up your uh, your team or your partners you're working with. But make sure there is some sort of termination there because if you're responsible for delivering something that you can no longer deliver, um, it it could get expensive in, in multiple different ways. But um, gets into default. So make sure every contract is a default clause. Um, it's just what happens when somebody doesn't hold up their end, you know, ensures that understand what could happen if you fail to perform your duties. Also, what legal recourse you might have if someone else fails, you know, how does that help you? If you're if you're in a chain of, OK, I need survey and I need this wetland stuff and then I can do my drainage design. And then I and then I hand that off and the prime does the roadway design. You look at that and you go, well, without my survey and without my my wetland delineation or my hydraulic uh, information, I can't move on to that next piece. So I'm stuck. But what does the contract say? What does that look like if there's uh, somebody else who causes you to default because you're, you can't get the information that, and they might not even have been a sub to you. They might have been somebody else's responsibility. Limitation on liability. This one is hard. You, I've, I've written it in a few contracts. Um, especially smaller ones. I don't want to be liable for $10 million if I have a $3,000 contract. Um, but it's one to always think about that that limitation of liability is a good piece to to add. And I do have a, a an example that I'll show you here in a couple of minutes that is a limitation of liability. It's really long-winded. Um, it was written by a lawyer, but uh, but it's it's a good starting point and and you can throw it in a contract. They might redline it out right away. Um, might not. You might be able to get it pushed through. And then look for blank spaces or errors. Most contracts are templates, or they're a copy of another project, and and they're just drugged down, and and you just use them over and over. And so so think about that. That as you're going through a contract, or you're doing a review internally. Like if I write a contract, hopefully I get somebody internally to review it before we send it out, because I might make that same mistake of. Uh, uh, the one the one I show I'll show you that I that was out sent out with the package you guys had it had the wrong state listed um, and that was a real contract that was for a real construction project and um, so that's just always you know just always do a good quality check uh, just some contract language wait 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 Ross oh, I want to interrupt ahead. you um, sure. can you go back to that slide yep so let's stop here. Um, and just let everybody just uh, look through their materials up to this slide. Does anybody have any questions or anything that they want clarification on? This is a pretty technical class. Yeah. Anybody? It's painful. It's painful. I know <laughs> that. But but if you use it as a checklist, which I actually have a checklist that, that I sent out with this, uh, and I'll show you that. I won't go into detail on it. So it just covers a lot of the stuff I've already talked about, but I'll show you that here in a second. But if you use Great. it as a checklist, you build your own checklist. It's maybe industry specific. Um, like obviously, I can't give legal advice, but I can help you guys. I can look at a couple of your contracts, help you develop a checklist. I mean, we can get there for you to to make sure uh, make sure that you're hitting on these kind of key general components. All right, I see Erica has her hand up and Erica will give me one second to add one thing to what Ross said. Our insurance company will also review our contracts for us, especially, um, well, especially for professional liability, but all of you need to have insurance. And we talked about that two weeks ago with the um, insurance class. Your insurance uh, provider wants you to have a good contract. So work with them. We talked about having an insurance broker. Work with your insurance broker and get into the habit of having them look at your contracts. Um, they may not have the expertise to review it, but their company will. All right. And Erica, you had a question? Yes. And thanks for that tidbit. That's um, that's pretty eye-opening. Uh, my question was, is in your experience for professional technical services is the um, the 
contract negotiation person on their end, on the client's end, usually the, the procurement person, the contract contact, or is, does the, um, does the, I usually call it hiring manager, does the, your counterpart, your point of contact for actually doing the work, does that person ever get involved in the negotiations? In my experience, it's always the, it's always the technical person and they are acting on behalf of their business own, you know, their company. So for example, if we do work with Braun, I will get the contract from the technical lead, but it'll be a standard Braun contract. So um, there's a little bit they end of up a, being a middleman. Yeah, yeah. They end up being a middleman kind of. Yeah. You're so, probably not going to okay. work with, with uh, probably not going to work with the attorney or the, the internal person that's a contracts expert, but you'll be working. And so, so I have seen that. That doesn't mean you can't it. though, right, Ross? I mean, you could call their, you could yep. go up the chain. Yep, for sure. And if okay. it's a big, if, if they're, if the risk is big enough, you know, if, if the risk is small, it's probably, um, I will tell you that, that we do accept a lot of things in contracts that we don't always like, but we look at the risk and go, okay, well, that's, that's a risk that's acceptable. Um, we never take ownership for other people's work. Those are kind of, kind of where I draw the line completely is that you want to make sure you're not taking responsibility for other people's work. And like I said, you're, and Anne said, your professional liability insurance won't cover that anyway. So you, nobody really wants you to do that, even though they'll try to do it. Um, it, it just seems like a, it's a, a lawyer game that I don't fully, uh, I don't like, but I, and I'm really not on board with, but. Thank you. Yep. Um, this one you guys can look at, I, I won't spend a ton of time on it, uh, but just think through what other words can we say, you know, approve, Workers in general conformance is a better way to say that approve because I'm not gonna, I don't, you don't really approve anything. You, you might accept it because it's in general conformance, but to approve something means that everything is right. Like I certified that everything here was done exactly as it was supposed to be. Without me building it, it might be nearly impossible. You know, I was on a large bridge project and, you know, we were, we were counting thousands of pieces of rebar every day. Is it an exactly a, a four foot 11 piece of rebar that was bent into a circle? I have no idea. It could be four foot 10. It could be four or five feet. I, I can say that in general, it's the right size. It's meeting the plan. It looks like the right piece of steel. I'm assuming it is, um, but I, I don't ever want to approve it. I just say, yeah, it looks like the right piece. Now, it would be impossible to actually approve that something was done exactly as drawn. You can look at these other ones. You know, equal, equivalent, I don't know, you know, that one's uh, just kind of softer words, but con consider revising words that are misinterpreted or subjective. Just try to get rid of them if you can. Um, so this, you guys probably, I don't know how big or little your screens are, but I'll pull up a PDF here. Um, so this, uh, this talks about some of what we've talked about. Uh, but if you're looking at a contract, these are just a dozen or so points that are good. So, you know, write clearly, spell out the duties and obligations, you know, ambiguous terms should be replaced. But you guys can read through this. It's kind of a summary of what we talked through, but I think it's a good, it's a good takeaway to just have with you or um, to use as you're building maybe your own template, uh, but kind of customizing, um, you know, liability should be a month that's fair. Um, to both you and your client for risk. That's that's one to always think about. Um, and then obviously the big piece that I didn't touch on, but agreement should say when and how you get paid. Um, those are good pieces. So then next to the, or the next sheet on that slide that I showed you, but this is a quick one that, that I, I didn't use this exact one, but I used a little bit different one in the past, but I, I, I do like this one too. This is bigger than contracts, but it's it's really risk, which if any one of these pieces has risk involved to it, you should think about that when you're putting your cost proposal together and when you're writing your when you get to the point of writing your contract. You know, and again, I won't read all these, but um, you know, does the project team actually have experience with it or is it the first time they've ever done anything like this? Um, are they financially stable? Like if you're working with developers, 
this is a key point that if a developer isn't financially stable, um, if they don't get the project done and they go out of business, you probably, you might not get paid. Uh, so, you know, just, these are all just kind of risk things, but, um, budget, you know, is the project adequately funded or the funds, um, is there unexpected contingencies, you know, can it be done within budget? You know, down here, you get into some schedule stuff too, is the schedule realistic, but you can, you can kind of pick through these and build your own. This is, this one is a little bit more geared, I think, towards uh, vertical construction or um, civil site design than than DOT work. But um, but you could see kind of you could build these out budget, you know, project considerations, things that that hopefully you or you can find a a mentor in your industry to help you uh, put together kind of some risks that are that are just it's good to have a checklist because then you'll do it when you get into a project. So. Uh, so this is in your packet. You can print it out. Like I said, I'd recommend you make your own that's industry specific. Um, so then actually I'll just stay here and I'll show you two contracts real quick. This one is in your handout and this is one that was marked up by an attorney. I pulled out most of the real project specific data, um, but the attorney didn't like subcontract agreement. This is an agreement, it's not a subcontract. It's an agreement. A subcontract is a type of agreement, but it's really just an agreement. But anyway, you get into kind of these, what are things called? Somewhere in here, we were called consultant. Other places, we were called subcontractor. And so that was, you know, just things that don't add up that a lawyer is good at catching. Um, so then our lawyer wrote a statement here on the, what the difference is between a subcontractor and a consultant. Um, you know, it's good detail. Uh, cost estimate should be included. So I'm just gonna run through these parts. This one is one that's actually for construction. And so think through that, that I'll show you really quick to a design one. Um, the construction one, you gotta hunt and peck for things. This is the way they almost always do them. And um, I think the AGC's contract is kind of that way, the Association of General Contractors. Um, but here it's saying you're gonna supervise all this work. That's a, a, a no-no. This talks about the standard of care. Our, the word reputable was in it. We got rid of that just because um, we we already, you know, that that's subjective. You know, we don't need reputable people. I mean, we do, but that's subjective on what that means. So get rid of that word. Um, this was just a necessary statement that they line out. We weren't required to provide a bond because we weren't doing actual construction work. We were doing um, just ad advisory work. Uh, I think scheduling work actually with this contract, but. Um, so just get rid of unnecessary statements that don't apply to you because then it, it doesn't become muddy later that we didn't provide a bond for zero dollars. That's what this is saying is we still needed to provide a bond even though it was for zero dollars. Doesn't make sense, right? Indef indemnification. Um, I, I didn't have this word up above, but I probably should have. The word defend is a really awful word. It means that we're gonna pay for their attorneys to help them, but well, we're not going to do that. We'll, we will, um, we'll, we'll meet all the basic requirements of our liability, but our attorneys won't pay, our insurance won't pay to defend. So, um, and their agents, you know, that's another word that it's talking about. Um, uh, you know, who are their agents? We have no idea what that even means. Is their agents, their subcontractors, or or who does that? Uh, you know, it doesn't make it. It's it's ambiguous. It could be anybody under the sun, and so we want this to be as uh, as straightforward as we can. And then subcontractor or subconsultants or anyone employed directly or indirectly. We don't employ people indirectly, so we just got rid of that. Um, insurance requirements pretty straightforward. Um, this one, our insurance says that they'll our our professional liability insurance says for each claim, it doesn't say occurrence. So our our insurance co company would not cover multiple occurrences. It's it's just language, right? But but make sure that you're meeting the requirements of your insurance company. I think that's one that actually our insurance provider pointed out to me. Um, this one they they didn't like words like arising out of. We said to the extent caused by, you can see there's quite a bit of stuff. You guys have this, so you can go through it. Uh, here's the dispute language. We don't have any issues here. 
it, it lays out real nicely the process for settling a dispute. You should make sure that's in your contract. Uh, termination, you know, it says seven calendar days, written termination. Uh, there are other repercussions for terminating the contract, but it does allow you to get out. Doesn't mean you'll get out free of any charge or anything. Um, this is just the error. It said Wisconsin and we're in Minnesota. Um, I think there's any, yeah, this is that limited liability. This was written by an attorney. You know, this was a small contract. So we thought $50,000 in liability was plenty good. And they did accept this, which surprised it, it, I guess it didn't surprise me, surprise me, but it was a, a pretty, pretty lengthy statement that we added that, uh, so they, they will accept changes. So keep that in mind. Like I said, you can use this, some version of it that's more applicable maybe to the, to the work that you do, um, your specific work type, but. Uh, so then I'll show you super quick, a, this is a professional services. Um, this is one you guys don't have. It's actually one of our contracts that I got you. you'll see in the professional services world is it just flat out lays out what's going on. You don't have to hunt and peck to find things. Scope of service, uh, cost of work, invoice payment, um, you know, project specific, which the other one had in there, but um, terms of agreement, performance, delays, service agreement, you know, then this one is one I did want to talk about. So this one is a subcontract to a master contract. And you could see that they referenced all of this in the master contract, which now becomes part of this contract. So you want to go hunt this contract down and look at all of this before you sign this one. Uh, and like I said, I didn't, we didn't, we did a thorough job of reviewing, but we, this is our third one under the same contract. So we've already accepted all this language and I, I gave a high level look, but I didn't, I didn't put a ton of detail into it. Um, just looked for changes pretty much was it, but, um, but you could see in here that there's standard of care language, like I talked about, um, key personnel are oftentimes listed. Obviously we have to comply with the laws. Data practices, that's one that you'll see how long you have to keep documents. Um, and it's usually three years or seven years, or it might be lifetime depending on what the, what the government regulation is, if it's a government contract. Um, notice termination. Uh, indemnification, this is one that, like I said, that's, you want to make sure you're only covering yourself and you're not taking liability from other people that you can't, that you can't control. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's about it. Insurance, obviously, general insurance and things like that. Um, so that was a ton on contracts. So that's, that's the end of getting through a contract, obviously, in, industry specific is uh is a key point here um so now if you get a contract with the government and this is going to be more more likely a professional technical services contract but um that are going to require you to bid a job the rates that you get paid are directly related to the cost that it that your business the cost it takes for your business to do work and so an audited overhead rate is used to calculate your fixed fee, which is your hourly rates that you're allowed to charge on a state and federal contract. So we're not allowed to charge exorbitant profits. Um, we're, we're pretty much fixed into a bucket of what you can get or what you, what they will pay you for, per hour uh, based on how your company operates. And so a really large company may have a, a high overhead rate, a small company may have a really low overhead rate, or a small company could have a high overhead rate depending on how um, what the requirements are of their business. If you have a lot of equipment, things like that, they drive up your overhead rate um, if they're if they're just considered general. So a cost plus fixed fee, which is really, I'll show you in a second here. Um, that's a piece of the overhead rate, or you get a fixed hourly rate. Uh, lump some contracts with government may be excluded from from requiring a uh, audited overhead rate. So one thing you'll hear in overhead rates, so this is, again, gets really technical in a hurry, but the word I always look for is this FAR. So it's a federal acquisition regulation, and that's what drives the basis for what we do in calculating our overhead rate. It defines 
what's included, what's not included. It defines, you know, how you uh, how you calculate it. Um, it puts together the whole process. If you have questions, you can you can go pick away there. Um, so the federal acquisition regulation, like I said, so here's two resources, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, um, Uniform Audit and Accounting Guide. And if you go to MnDOT's Consultant Corner, they have these two documents, links to them, and they talk about a lot of this stuff in a lot more detail. So as you're negotiating a contract, that's kind of why this overhead rate is a piece of it, is when you're negotiating what you're gonna get paid, that's why this is really important. Um, so an overhead rate, there's a, we have an overhead rate as PE services, and it's not actually an audited, it's, it's an approved overhead rate, but it's not actually audited. It's an unaudited overhead rate that we prepare ourselves, which is fairly easy to prepare using your, um, using your uh, income statement, your P&L, and just some basic things that I'll show you here in a second. And I did give you an example. I actually gave you a spreadsheet um, to calculate this. So, and then there that if, if you go to the state audit um, website there, which you guys have the link to in the PDF you have, um, that gets you there and gives way more information. This is one you guys call me if you get into it and you really don't get it. Um, I'm submitting ours right now for 2022. So going through the process again and, and, and just kind of fresh in my mind. Um, so what is an overhead rate? It's a, it's a percentage and it's the indirect cost of your business. Ross, quick um, question. There's uh, questions in the chat. Oh, sure. Erica, you want to go ahead? Oh, it just says in a contract with an out of state entity, is it better to have any disputes handled in Minnesota or the other state? Also, is it better to have a contract go to arbitration or other type of dispute resolution? Okay, yeah, so it gets back to contracts. Good question. Definitely worth talking about. <clears throat> um, we always want the dispute to be settled in the state that you reside in, um, typically just because you're better at what's going on there. Um, you might not have that choice. I know in, I, I know in my Texas contracts, we have to follow the Texas rules, and that's where disputes would be settled, and that's um, just is what it is. Now, as far as dispute resolution, um, it's basically an escalation tree, which I was going to put in here, but my presentation was already getting too long. But, um, you know, so obviously negotiation is the first part that that makes the most sense. Negotiate, try to work through it. Relationships are everything in our business. And maintaining that relationship may require you to give even when legally you don't have to. Um, but yeah, so negotiate is obviously the first one. And then the next one is mediation. And most contracts will drive you to mediation, which is uh, an industry expert that takes uh, takes submittals from both people. It's the next cheapest form of negotiating a, a dispute. But they'll take both information from both parties, they review it, and then they take that information. You typically have a, a meeting. I've been in a few of these, you have a meeting. They might ask you both your questions. You're both in separate rooms, so they're not, you're not arguing in front of each other or anything. Um, and and he's just going to make a decision based on on what uh, on what he thinks is best. And then arbitration gets and and it could be binding or non-binding with mediation or arbitration. Uh, if it's non-binding, it might get escalated to arbitration, which is I think is more is is more of a legal process and is facilitated by a judge and is, is just a more cumbersome, more expensive process. And then obviously litigation is the last one is to go to court. But, um, but yeah, if you're reviewing your contracts, you want mediation in there because none of us, none of us small companies can afford to pay the, the costs that it, it would cost to go to court on a lot of these things. So, so yeah, great question. Um, definitely, uh, definitely worth thinking about, but you want to see mediation in all your contracts and then binding is typically the it, binding is the cheapest option if it's non-binding it just might get everybody walks away and it gets kicked up the, the ladder and it doesn't it's going to cost you more money anyway so overhead rate the direct labor is 
wages paid. That's how you define your direct, it's your wages paid. Your indirect costs are all other business costs, less the uh, unallowable costs. So, um, so as, as we're figuring out our indirect costs, you know, it's cost of vehicles, cost to keep the lights on, buildings, all that kind of stuff. There are things that, that the government agencies won't pay for in their overhead rate or won't pay, they don't consider in the overhead rate. So essentially they're telling you, we won't pay for these things in our contracts. So like the previous company I worked for, their overhead rate, their actual overhead rate ran about 15% higher than their, their, their government overhead rate because they have, um, well, let's just go through the list real quick. So things in the overhead rate that are not allowed, advertising trade shows, um, trade show labor. So if you go to a convention, and it's educational, it's it's allowed in the overhead rate. But the second you set up a trade show booth there and you start um, doing promotional uh, kind of work, and then it's not um, kind of the way that we look at it is if it's a direct sell or it's educational. So direct sell, meaning I'm working on a specific project or it's educational, then it would be allowed. But if it's, uh, if it's you're just out selling your company, um, even if it's lunches or anything like that, that you're just generally talking about what you're doing. Uh, it's not allowable. Um, so memberships in community, civil, community organizations. Now, that, that, that one, they will pay. Some of it is allowable if it's a professional organization. That's different than a community organization. Um, bad debts, they won't collection costs. Personal use of company vehicles is one that like even commuting that you, you have to subtract your, like my truck, we put maybe 25,000 miles a year on it. I drive it to work every day. That's going to be 4,000 miles a year, 5,000 miles a year. I have to subtract that out. That commuting and personal use of company vehicle is not allowed in the overhead rate. Um, donations are to gifts, employee gifts, recognition. Uh, country club type stuff isn't hockey tickets, things like that, um, social activities, fines, penalties, uh, gains or losses. These are like write-ups or write-downs. So like exorbitant profits on a, on a, on a certain project or losses on a, on a non-DOT project are, are not allowed. Or if you overrun a budget, that overrun piece is not allowed as an indirect cost it becomes part of your direct cost, even though you never collected on it. Um, life insurance, so life insurance is fine. We have life insurance on all of our employees and that's included. But if you have expensive or like life insurance, like million dollar, $10 million policies on key people, that that's excluded. Um, to run through here, I mean, organizational uh, accounting fees. One that, that was interesting to me, may, oh yeah, first one, Interest expenses, so interest on loans, on vehicles, things like that are not. Um, alcoholic beverages, obviously. So if you're taking somebody to lunch and you're talking about project work, it, it's it's allowable. If you're drinking, it's not allowable. So just keep that in mind that that you got to keep basically stay professional pretty much. Um, so what is your overhead rate? Like I said, it's your it's your it's your fringe cost and your general overhead. So that's your, they always bucketize them differently in your, uh, in your P and L. Um, so your direct cost is just your labor. So this is not our company. This is MnDOT sample right off their website. You can go download this. It's actually, you guys have it. It was emailed out to you last night. It's in a spreadsheet. This just has the rows collapsed, but there's a ton of detail. And it looks like a, actually what you could get out of QuickBooks or or what a general ledger organization organized would be in the P&L. Um, so our direct labor cost is 1.9 million. Our overhead costs are 2.5 million. So just like we said, the calculation is easy as that. It's, it's the indirect cost divided by the direct cost. This overhead rate for this company is a one point, or is 127%. And they always go to two decimal places. Um, so to get your overhead rate approved, again, you guys can look at this. We don't have to go into a lot of detail. 
um, I can definitely help you with this. Like I said, I'm going through it right now. It's uh, it's pretty straight. It's uh, it's it's time consuming to put together, but um, but especially for a smaller company, excuse me, they get pretty straightforward. So so they have a questionnaire you got to fill out. Um, there's two of them. There's a pre award audit, audit one, and then there's a uh, just one a checklist pretty much for this process. Overhead calculation, um, reconciliation of overhead, um, financial statements, certification of indirect costs. That's just you certifying that yes, this is this is correct, and this is for a, this is for a company, a non audited one, or not. It's not audited by a CPA firm. It's what something you would put together yourself. Uh, fixed hourly rate template. We're going to look at that in a second. Um, the rent control, I think that one I'm not for, I'm familiar with the, the statement, but I've never had to do anything with it. Um, but I could learn more and help you guys out with that if we need to. Approval letters from other states. So if you're out, if your overhead's already been approved somewhere else. And then the PPP loan, um, that's the, the, the COVID loan. And you just certify how you dealt with that in your company, if you got money from the government due to COVID or not. And that's just part of how that feeds into your, your overhead costs. But we're getting far enough away from that that nobody, I don't think, had any money in that in 22. So that'll probably go away here on future, uh, future submissions. So now how do we calculate an hourly rate, right? So we have an overhead rate now. And um, I didn't talk about this, but oops, where did it go? We have a fixed, or so... We have a wage, um, we have something called a fixed fee on a project. So our wage, let's say a person makes 30 bucks an hour, our overhead rate was 127.63%. And then the profit on a project, we don't get to pick our profit on a professional services, uh, professional technical services contract. MnDOT has uh, a fixed fee calculation sheet that's based on the risk of the project. And then some features of your company, if you have a lower overhead rate, you can get more profit. Uh, a lot of times, though, we're capped by what the prime is stuck at, which that's uh, it's a little bit of a hindrance to small businesses. But if we're a subcontractor to somebody, we might be capped by the percent profit that they're getting. Um, so calculation, so it's a wage times one plus the overhead rate times one plus the fixed fee. So essentially, it's, um, oh, I screwed it up here. I should have added two. So it's $30. This should be 227 because it should be, or it should be 100 actually plus, but it's a percentage uh, times one plus 13%. So it ends up being $77. And you guys have this in the Excel sheet that was sent out. You can see how it calculated it out. So essentially, on this job with this company, a $30 an hour person would bill out at $77.17. Um, so this is how you would calculate your, your hourly rate for a professional services contract. And so then if you had 1,000 hours of labor times at $77, 77 $0.17, cents, um, you know, that would determine your contract to be a $77,000 contract. Um, like I said, the spreadsheet you guys have, it looks similar to this. It has a few more columns in it, but um, you can play with that. The MnDOT profit is capped at 15% is the highest you can get and 9% being the base. And so just keep that in mind kind of as you're going through this. Um, so the last piece here is the pre-award project audit. And so once you win a job, so you go through this, you put a cost estimate together, you, you successfully bid on a project, either win it yourself or you're a sub to somebody on a project. You get through all that and, and now you win a job. And your prime says, or or even you might be the prime, MnDOT says, okay, for you to have a contract with us, we're going to set up, you have to pass a pre-award audit. And it's like, well, we already went through this audit that you see up here for our overhead rate submission. Now we got to do very similar exercise again. Um, and, and this really is, it, it seems like, especially to small businesses, it seems like a nuisance, but it really is important because what was happening probably maybe seven, eight years ago, maybe longer than that, but I only worked on one job that this ever happened on, but they would find all these errors at the end of a project. 
and they would have to go through and adjust all these things. So this pre-award audit, it's a bunch of stuff we have to send in and the auditors put the effort into to making it work. Um, but it, it is actually good to do because then we, at the end of the job, we don't get, they don't find all these errors and things that weren't allowed or things that changed that we should have known about and stuff. So, um, so, you know, they, they just allow more efficient project closeout on MnDOT side and it, it's less impact for us as far as just um, maybe having to give money back or something because something changed. On the left there, I got some links. The MnDOT pre-award audit um, office. Uh, there's a pre-award audit checklist, which is actually these two sheets that you see here. You can see it, it requires a lot of the same stuff that's required for, for the overhead rate submittal. Um, then it gets into kind of some of these summaries. There, basically, you're you, you're going to submit your whole everything for your pre or for your uh, for your uh, overhead rate submission, all of this, plus a few other things. They want to know, example, timesheets. You know, some of this stuff is just you know, what do you do? How do you track things? Um, the checklist actually, uh, both of them talk about your accounting systems. And it's fine to write, you don't have complicated accounting systems. The questions aren't there to trick you or to get you in trouble or anything. Um, just answer them honestly. And, and I, there's a few pieces we don't have that a, that a larger, more sophisticated or, or company would have. And we do a good job of, of just writing what we do actually do and tell them what we actually do. And we've never, we've had them ask questions, but we've never actually had problems where they, they push back and go, well, you can't, you got to do that different or, or that doesn't work or, or the couple of things they do have one thing that I can think of that they didn't like and and they helped us work through it on how to do it right. So so it, it it's it's a good experience just to you know they, you'll get smarter working with them and that staff if you do get to this. this yeah, point. and if you guys, this is Anne. If you guys remember, Jeff went through this in the um, last class on insurance. Jeff or Ross or even I can help you with these uh, applications. Yep. And MnDOT does have a really good YouTube video that that I use to, uh, or I used it originally to learn about what they do. And I can't remember if it's on their website, but I, I put the link here to YouTube. Um, it's about an hour and a half. If you're just going through the, the project audit, it it walks through all the pieces. Um, like Ann said, though, we're more than willing to help because you know, we, can, we can streamline if you have specific questions. Uh, the rest of the checklist, uh, there is some things they look at like your compensation, if you're if you're way over, or if you're highly compensated employee, not all your wage might be allowed, and so you just have to show that in the matrix, and that would be coming out of your overhead rate anyway. Um, but they still just make a double check there, that because a lot of times we'll get our overhead rates approved, and then maybe bonuses come out after that, and so there are things that change throughout the year that they're trying to capture here, so you, that you don't get in a pickle later when you're when they're closing out the contract and. You have to owe, uh, uh, owe money back. But yeah, that Paycheck Protection Program, that's one that it's a letter. I MnDOT mean, has a canned letter for almost all these things. You don't have to reinvent them. There's a spreadsheet for National Compensation Matrix. There's, um, you know, most of these components are, are things that are, are, all of them are things people have produced before, but most of them are templates on their website. So they're, they're not that hard. And they do have an example. They do have the video. Um, but yeah, so then you fill out your pre-award audit, you get an email maybe three, four weeks later um, that all the audits were, or there were no questions on the audit, or maybe they'll have questions and your concrete contract gets executed and um, you go through all this and then you get to finally do some work. <laughs> but, uh, so that was a lot. Um, this is Thank a hard you. topic, Ross. So I think you did a great job. Yeah. So and make after sure, nine thirty, go ahead and and wrap it up. Yeah, and make sure you yeah. check the chats. Uh, there's some good links that have been dropped in there. I wasn't quite sure how to interject with those, but uh, check the chats uh, um, for for those uh, additional links to help you out with some resources. And I can't remember if we can. I think we can copy or download the chat. Yeah, I will. I will download the chat and we'll add that to the resources. Yeah, and then we can send that out with the resources and uh, um, 
Well, yeah. I mean, if we wanted to go into all these submittals, like I said, that, that YouTube video is good. It's an hour and a half also. Um, they could be their own topic on their own, but uh, that was done by one of the MnDOT auditors and he did a really nice job with it. So um, we probably don't have to super reinvent the wheel there. Um, but yeah, ask us questions, email me and Eric. Um, you can you, you can call us, our company's phone number's online. Otherwise, um, email me and you'll get all my contact information and we can definitely will help out. We can we can review things for you. We can uh, we can't give legal advice. We're not attorneys, but we can give template advice and we can give you pointers on how we've dealt with things in the past. Okay. Hey, Ross, will you minimize or close out that email that you have popped up on your screen? Oh, yeah. yeah that's All right. So with that, it. thank you, Cassie. Uh, we're still working with MnDOT to post the recorded videos. I will check into that today and maybe we'll send out an email. I mean, um, MnDOT has them. Uh, I think they're just trying to figure out how best to load them. So everybody listening, I will send out a link as soon as we have it to everybody who has attended any one of the training sessions. And then um, we will also include that link is going to have every single video on it. So I'll talk to Sue today and we'll figure out um, how to manage that. It's just challenging because these videos are gargantuan because, you know, they're two hours of Zoom talk. So we'll make sure that we get that information out. Um, anybody else? I will also save the chat since I'm the owner of the Zoom. I will change. I will save the chat for everybody. And Ross, thank you for your information. Ross is really an expert in this area, uh, as is Jeff Stewart. So anybody have questions, remember that um, we will be happy to meet with you independently. As Ross said, we're not attorneys, we're not insurance people, but we can definitely serve as a resource to put you in touch with people who can help you, all right? So with that, 936, anybody have any other questions? All right, the next session is responding to an RFP. Um, I think I'm teaching that. There's one coming up that I can't teach, but I think the 19th is me responding to an RFP. Just for those of you on the call that may be new, RFP stands for Request for Proposal uh, for Professional Technical Firms. This is the way that we get work. We have to send in a proposal in response to a request for a proposal. So we'll share some ideas on that as well as some templates and describe the process. Um, financial management then is our first class that we'll conduct over the, the lunch hour. So take note, the April 19th class continues at the same morning time from eight to 9.30 and the financial management class the week following is at 11.30. All right, so we'll be in touch. Thank you, Ross. Thanks everybody for attending and we will talk soon. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Ross, I can't end until I save the chat. So give me a second here. Bye Eric, thanks for your help today. Yep, no problem.